verses of scripture. Listen to the word in John 1, verse 12 through 13. It says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, look at this, which were born not of blood, born again, not of blood, not of heritage, nor of the will of the flesh, not of desire, a special desire that happened in you, nor of the will of man, not because other, one, other people wanted you to be saved, but of God. So it wasn't our will. Romans 9, 15 through 16 says it this way. We'll preach this chapter next in Romans 9. It says, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not, verse 16 of Romans 9, so then it is not of him that willeth or of him that runneth, that means the guy who is coming after salvation, but of God that showeth mercy. God is extremely clear. We will have to distort his word not to believe it. We are also told our, our condition as aliens and enemies and sheep going astray and none that seeketh after God and altogether become unprofitable and none that doeth good. All of these point to the fact that way back before the world began when God foreknew you by name to become the child of his grace. What he knew that caused him to set in motion his great purpose to save you had nothing to do with who you were, what you wanted, or what you would do. It was all about him. It was all about him. However, what we do know is that your name was on his mind. This is often why I say that God's love is one-sided. It's not a response to something he saw in you. It's not like, oh, I like, I like that, so I'm going to save him. It's not like, oh, he has the right conditions. What were the right conditions? That you were his enemy and alien and that you sinned every day against him? You had no right conditions to be saved. None of us have any right conditions to be saved. And this is what it means in the scriptures when it says that God is no respecter of persons. He didn't save you because you made some qualification. He didn't save you because you generated some qualification. Or that you were better than the guy against the road, that, uh, or, uh, on the other side of the road that curses Jesus. His foreknowledge had to do with him. He foreknew you. Step two, he predestinated you to be conformed to the image of his son. This word appears six times as, in scripture or New Testament as predestined or before ordained. In our Bibles, in the New Testament, four of those times are speaking directly of salvation. And again, this is a simple word, not to be despised, it's to be loved. It means God determined beforehand, but what did he predetermine here? Notice the verse, notice it clearly. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what he predetermined about you when he would save you. That he was going to conform you to the image of his son. The verse is clear. He predetermined that what he would do after he saved you, and I talk about a ticket to heaven, he would not just, you would not just sit there with your ticket and wait, for, uh, wait to, to, for Jesus to return or whatever. There would be something happening in your, your life. He would be molding you, and every day he is molding you to the image of Jesus. He is bringing different pressures upon your life to mold you. These are sanctifying words, sanctification words that happen after salvation. But it's like, it's like God thought way back. He thought this, I'm going to take Elizabeth. People who sit in front row get names called. I'm going to take Elizabeth. And through all the circumstances of Elizabeth's life, and through the surgery of my Bible on her, my word on her, I'm going to sculpt her to be like Jesus. And you put your name in there. And that's what he's doing every day. And that's where he's headed. And he predetermined that that's what he was going to do. He was going to sculpt you to look like Jesus. They say of sculptors, great sculptors, men that can do it, that is not the fact that they are, they are cutting all this stuff away to make this picture. In fact, there are many great sculptors have said it's just the opposite. I'm, I've got a picture in my head. 
a sculpture in my head and I'm cutting away anything on that block that doesn't look like the picture in my head. And so is God. He's cutting away in your life on a daily basis these infirmities that we talked about in verse 26. He is cutting away anything that doesn't look like Jesus. This is what he's doing. He's actively, actively doing through preaching and through your devotion time and through people interacting with you and people confronting you in your job, in your sicknesses, in your financial whatever. He is doing it. He's sculpting you. He predetermined that that's what he was going to do after he saved people. He was going to sculpt them. That is wonderful. And that's what he's doing in your life. In the other places that predestination appears, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and 11, it says that God predetermined our adoption and he predetermined our inheritance. He had it all figured out. God never works on the fly. Now, why would he ever do that for a sinner like me and a sinner like you? Now, why would he ever do that? Friend, that's what we call grace. That's what grace is all about. It's so marvelous and so illogical to us because it is from God. And it is grace. It is an opportunity for God to show his character. To save you is an opportunity to sculpt you like, to be like Jesus. And an opportunity for God to show his grace. On you who does not deserve it, his love that decided to love me despite not because of who I was, that is grace. It is God. It is not like man. It is not earthly. It is godly, and it's wonderful. God predetermined the tragedy in your life that would take the chunk of clay out of you that didn't look like Jesus. Did you hear that? There are people in this auditorium that have gone through great tragedies. Great tragedies. Great problems. Look around for Lisa. Lisa lost her father this past week or week and a half. There are people diagnosed with cancer in our church. There are people that have, been mur that have had children murdered. There are people in our church that have children murdered that they never found the murderer. God takes the chunk of clay off of you by tragedy, by infirmity, and what he is leaving behind in the sculpture only looks like Jesus. He's conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ. He is molding a masterpiece of his purpose. And you are the vessel of mercy that he's doing it with. You are what he is doing. You are the, the infirmities, the problems are all about him predestinating that you would be conformed to the image of his son. He will carve you every day until he puts that final touch in your, on your life at the rapture or in your death. And then you will be like Jesus because 1 John 3, 2 says you will see him as he is. There's a big note here. He is conforming you so that, verse number 29b, he is conforming you so that, look at it, that, this is called a henna clause. It means it's a purpose. For the purpose, why is he, why did he predestinate to conform me to the image of Jesus? That he might, he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. That is the reason. That is probably the most significant phrase here. The phone rang as I was studying this on my back porch this week. And it was my good friend Dale Gooding, who's a pastor down in South Carolina. And uh, I was studying, and I told him what I was studying. He says, you know it's all about, that whole passage is about 29b, don't you? And I didn't want to seem dumb. So I said, of course. Of course, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh. I, and I thought in my mind, I'm going to get to that point. I'm going to be studying what... Why? He says it's all, it all hinges there, Toby. That's the key to the whole thing. I said, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, well, yeah, anybody who really, this is exactly what I said. Oh, anybody who really comes to this passage with open eyes would know that. <laughs> I actually said that. As I studied out for the rest of the afternoon, I found out what he meant. 
He is conforming you so that the end of verse number 29, so that Jesus could be the firstborn among many brethren. Many brethren that will be perfect like him. He will be among them. He will be in the future among us. He will be in the future the firstborn among us. Location. Location. We'll finish this point in a minute. We'll finish the sermon with it. But before we do, I want to hit steps three, four, and five so you can understand your part, the steps, your part, and how he called you to salvation so that you can get the whole picture of what God has done for you. He foreknew you. He predestinated you. Step three, verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. He called you. He called you. By experience in scripture, I can tell you emphatically that concerning how you got saved, you didn't call on him first. He was calling on you. And I think if we heard our testimonies and we, we put it across the room tonight, many of us were in the midst of sin when the Lord started working on our heart unexplainably. We weren't looking for him. He was looking for us. We were the sheep that were gone astray. He is the one who came after us to find us. We were the one. Heading, we are heading the opposite direction of God. Each of the circumstances to your salvation are different in this room. All different testimonies all across the room. But each of us have a, has a story about how the Father drew us. Each of us have a, has a story that we, like the prodigal son, woke up in the pig pen. I will arise and go to my Father. And some, some here tonight, your stories are so dramatic that other people would shout at the story. Because it makes no logical sense and grace comes shining through. Others of us were gently brought to the Lord when we were young children like myself. However, that's a great testimony also because I escaped the whole life of wicked sinfulness. God's grace hit me early and I praise the Lord for that. But no matter what the case, the Bible says he called you. He called you. Whatever your story, the Lord called you. 1 Corinthians 1-2 says that we are called to be saints. A church is the called out ones. It's the group of called out ones. We are called out of this world. And at that moment when your eyes opened and you responded with faith to his grace of killing Jesus for you, you responded in faith, you believed that he killed Jesus for you, you responded in faith that he killed Jesus because he chose to love you at that moment. He justified you. That word could, could, could be a whole series of messages, and tonight it's only one paragraph. But you notice the next phrase, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he called, and whom he called, them he also justified. At that moment, a most glorious thing happened. And anyone, listen, anyone here that struggles with assurance of salvation, you need to understand the deal. You need to understand that your salvation is not, you're not teetering on some tightrope somewhere, almost falling off. You need to understand that this is a work of God in your life. He called you out. He's in full control. You have no jeopardy of losing what you did not get for yourself. He justifies us. When he saved us, when we respond in faith, he justified you. The word is too good to be true. Because of his grace to perform Calvary in the empty tomb, God justly has the right to declare the nasty sinner free from all offense, spotless, pardoned forever. God is the great judge. Listen to me. Listen. you got to get it. God is the great judge, and he does things right and fair. And he did not skip any steps in what justly made you pardoned. He justly punished his son as a replacement to you he justly paid for your sins and when he justly paid for your sins somebody had to die somebody had to be tortured somebody had to take hell for you in your place and when he justly did it then he said he turned to you who believed that and said Eric you are justified justified and I did it the right way and it's fully paid for and there's no risk to the deal. There's no double jeopardy. I won't decide one day. Your, your sins are all paid for. There will not be a time down in history somewhere where you answer for them again. There is therefore no, now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Justified. Justified. And the deal is done.